Welcome to part three of the introduction to orbital mechanics and thanks once again to the folks at AGI and PLTW for providing the content. Uh, in this segment, which is the last one, part three of three, we're going to be taking a look at some special orbit types. Um, while we always have to find the six orbital elements, um, these special orbit types have some different orbital element types, not a different type, but different values for the types that we already know. So let's take a look. Well, we know what low Earth orbit is, or LEO. Uh, and one thing to know that uh, between the different types, LEO, uh, medium Earth orbit, and high Earth orbit, so there's really no defined value of what is low and what is medium and high and so on. Um, there are some special cases though. But low Earth orbit means it's really close to Earth. Um, and on the next slide you'll see what the scale might be. A lot of times when we draw orbits to talk about them, they're not to scale in it. So it can look like when you see a real uh, orbit that it's a little out of whack, but that's not true. Um, they do have very short orbital periods, relatively speaking, and you could say, well, 90 minutes isn't really short. Um, 90 minutes is about what it takes for the space station, for example, to orbit. Um, and by close to Earth, we mean uh, a couple hundred miles, two, three, four hundred miles. Those are some pretty, uh, pretty low orbits. One of the advantages that low Earth orbits have is that um, they can see close to Earth, closer to Earth than higher orbits, uh, but one of the limitations is that they can't see as much. So, for example, some of the uh, the types of satellites you might find are weather satellites um, and anything requiring imagery. A lot of spy satellites uh, are low Earth orbit. So here we see what I was mentioning before. This is a, a a real picture, if you will. It's drawn to scale of the International Space Station. Now here it says a, a orbit of 350 kilometers. Um, it generally orbits in between 220 to 240 miles. And as we draw it to scale, you can see how close it actually is to Earth, or how low it is. The next thing we're going to take a little bit closer look at is geostationary. A lot of people use the term geosynchronous. Um, and one special thing about geosynchronous orbits is that they follow the sun. And as you watch the video here in the lower right, you can see the Earth spin and the satellite essentially follows the sun or follows that point about the Earth. The altitude is pretty much, it has to be constant, so it has to be as circular as possible, and that altitude is about 22,200 miles. Ideally, you would like to have your inclination to be exactly zero. However, in practice, um, that's pretty uh, pretty hard to achieve. So as we look at some ground traces in the following slides, you'll see um, that they do very slightly. So geo, of course, refers to um, geostationary, geosynchronous, and uh, that only they can only view uh, because they're so far away. They can only view uh, plus or minus 70 degrees, which is actually quite a bit compared with something, say, like the space station. Actually, if you go out and view the space station, um, and, and I've done this, you can see it from where we are flying over Canada. You can see it flying over Toronto, which might seem like a long ways. And for us here on Earth, it is. But when it's so close, you really don't get a large swath. And that's one big benefit of having a geosynchronous satellite. One of the main purposes of those satellites is to act as communication satellites, whether that's um, TV or telephone communications. It might also be used um, as a relay station for um, other satellites, which we're going to see uh, uh, called constellations. We'll see in another slide. 
Well, as we've already mentioned, geosynchronous satellites have one altitude, the 22,000 plus miles, and they follow the sun. Uh, what this slide shows is uh, sort of a top-down view, um, and all of the little dots here on this slide represent a geostationary satellite. Um, the, the dots, of course, are not to scale, so it might look like some of them are sitting on top of each other. They're actually not. Um, but you can see how there is limited real estate. Um, even though the satellites themselves are pretty small, it's a bit of a challenge to get one in exactly the right spot. Uh, so there is limited space. And when one of the <coughs> excuse me satellites uh, runs out of fuel, which it has to have because it does drift a little bit so you need a little fuel to move it around you might move it you might change the inclina inclination slightly um, and it might drift east or west so it's really common to have called it's called station keeping um, and a lot of other satellites regardless of whether they're geostationary or low earth orbit um, have fuel on board to make such uh, such adjustments. For example, the space station uh, will reboost from uh, a low altitude to a high altitude. When one, um, when a geosynchronous satellite does run out of fuel, right before it does that, um, the the owner of the satellite knows how much fuel is left, or should know, um, and when it gets close, it kind of kicks it out to a higher orbit, um, a couple hundred kilometers away, and so that kind of essentially becomes a a satellite graveyard. What this slide shows is uh, a ground trace um, and it's a one week ground trace and you might say well wow that looks like um, something that we that we're familiar with but you have to take a look at the scale so the scale here shows plus or minus uh, a quarter of a degree latitude and from 82 to 81 so one degree longitude uh, and that's over a week so to correct for that you would have to do some station keeping um, uh, and I'd already talked uh, a little bit about that so I don't need to mention that anymore what this slide shows it's kind of interesting it actually shows ground traces so these aren't orbits. This is a, a ground trace of different geosynchronous satellites. Um, and you can see a lot of different things here. The colors just indicate uh, where the data set came from. But you see large figure eights here, um, and that really indicates um, an instability. <clears throat> a satellite that basically ran out of fuel. You also see a sine wave here, uh, and this of course is uh, over time. It, it didn't move actually this far. Uh, but that is a satellite that has moved from east to west or west to east. It's kind of hard to tell in this picture. So here's a question for you. If you're here in the United States and you're lost, you don't have any compass or GPS, it's kind of cloudy so you can't really see the sun, and you don't, there's no moss around. We know moss grows on the north side of things, or generally does. How do you figure out which direction is north, south, east, and west? Well, one thing you can do is look at uh, communication dishes. Communication dishes, think of DISH or DirecTV. Um, some buildings have satellite dishes on them. They all have to point generally south. They might not point exactly south, but they'll point generally south, plus or minus a few degrees. So once you can see where they're pointing, you can figure out where south is and figure out the rest. Well, if you live in Russia, uh, we had mentioned that geosynchronous satellites have a generally plus or minus 70 degree uh, field of view if you will. Russia if you take a look at it here on, on this map you can see a lot of it is uh, at 70 degrees or even farther north. Yeah some of it is below even 60 degrees but here's a couple of problems with that. Uh, number one half the country lies you know above 60 degrees and 
what happens is if you're a satellite at an, at the equator to communicate with even just part of Russia, even the southern part of Russia, you have to send your signal through a thicker part of the atmosphere. Um, and with that, you get a lot of losses. On the ground, you're going to have to point your satellite dish uh, not up towards the sky, but you're going to have to point it closer to the ground. So it's only going to be about 20 degrees. So it's almost going to be pointing straight across. Um, and if you're in a house or a small building, that really becomes impractical because you're going to have to point around other buildings, taller buildings, or trees. So if you live in Russia, they have a or any northern latitudes. Uh, parts of Canada might use this as well. It's called a Molnia orbit or Mali for short. Um, and let's take a look at what that looks like. So we'll go ahead and play the, the video here. And this is what a Mali orbit looks like. So it's apogee is it has a, a high eccentricity so it's not geosynchronous and the whole point of a Molnia orbit is to loiter for lack of a better expression over Russia. So remember from uh, Kepler's laws that during apogee and let's play that again let's play that one more time at apogee the satellite is going slow so it's gonna hover over Russia almost uh, and then it's gonna go a lot quicker as it gets toward apogee so that orbit and there's gonna here's what a ground trace is gonna look like and let's go ahead and play this there's one thing you'll notice is that if you watch both of these together that the ground trace does come up over Russia and it slows down and then it's gonna speed up again as it nears perigee what do you notice though about the ground trace you should notice that while it hangs over Russia which is good for Russian communication it also hangs over North America and that's also good for spying on North America and getting some other data and they really can't do any uh, good get any good photographic intelligence but what they can get is a lot of signal intelligence and we've talked a little bit about polar orbits and polar orbits are a special condition where the angle of inclination is 90 degrees and what's really good about polar orbits is that um, over time and especially the closer they are to earth the lower their altitude uh, the more frequently they will fly over every single part of the earth uh, the North Pole the South Pole every longitude every latitude eventually they will cover the whole earth um, there's a special type called sun synchronous which passes over the same part of earth at roughly the same local time each day so that might be useful if you want to look at say uh, atmospheric conditions or temperatures uh, you might look at air pollution during a specific time of day um, a sun synchronous orbit is very helpful for those types of conditions finally let's take a look at a concept called constellations so these aren't really special orbits per se but it's a group of satellites that work together to perform a specific uh, mission so for example I don't know what specific constellation this is but here's an example of what one would look like and you are all familiar with GPS you have it on your phone and this is this is what a GPS constellation would look like uh, they might communicate with each other so if you have uh, let's say this uh, this part of Earth is North America and you want to communicate with someone in Australia well you would have to communicate you would have to jump between satellites to communicate or you might communicate with a geosynchronous satellite which might then beam your information back to Australia
So here are a couple of questions for you to think about, and we're going to end on. So if Norway wanted to obtain some satellite imagery of all its major urban areas, what type of orbit would be appropriate? And if you're not familiar with where Norway is, it's in Europe, and it's uh, a great part of it is above the Arctic Circle. So it has a very northern latitude, a lot like Russia, that we talked about. Second question is, um, if you have researchers or scientists at McMurdo Station, which is in Antarctica, or the South Pole, um, can they use geosynchronous or geostationary satellites for their communication? If not, why not, and what might they use?